Hey, what's happening, folks? We are back for another episode of Daily Fantasy Knockout, episode 75, breaking down UFC 227. As always, I'm your host, Drew. Look a little different today. I uh, Technical difficulties, I'm out of town, and my laptop that I brought with me does not have a video camera. So y'all get to look at this picture of me in a chair, plus my co-host, as always, the brains behind the operation, Josh at Stonewall MMA. Josh, what's going on, big guy? Oh, uh, where's where's Drew? I I don't see I don't see. Oh, Drew. Oh, oh. I'm oh. Still looking. <laughs> hey man, uh, I'm doing I'm doing pretty good. Uh, thank you guys for tuning in with us uh, a little bit later episode this week because of Drew's constant globe trotting. He's you know off ma- wheeling and dealing, making deals, or uh, where's the wedding this weekend? You're in you know every wedding this weekend. Yep. Is it like an eerie law that you have to be uh, a groomsman in like every wedding that takes place? Pretty much, man. I mean, sorry I have friends. <laughs> yeah, what's that what like? At me. <laughs> um, so, yeah, are you ready to uh, get into this card? Yeah, let's do it. Before we do that, thank you, everyone, for watching. Make sure to like, subscribe, positive rating, give us a review on iTunes, Stitcher. Um, we thank you guys for that support. And, uh, yeah, let's dive into this, Josh. First fight of the night, we have Marlon Vera versus Wuji Biren. All right, so Vera is one of the biggest favorites on the card. Uh, I think he's the second most expensive. Uh, he opened at minus 230, but is now out all the way to minus 550 um, with an inside distance prop of plus 138, 9,300 on DraftKings. Beren opened plus 170, but has risen all the way to plus 425 with an inside distance prop of plus 970 and is 6,900 on DraftKings. So I thought Vera was kind of like, uh, you know, Middle of the road ish action fighter. Is he really that much? Is I mean, I guess is Beren really that bad? Yeah, man. And, and, and you kind of hit the nail on the head. Nobody, I don't like playing Marlon Vera. Uh, I just can't get behind him in DraftKings as much as I'd like to. Uh, throws at a pretty low rate. He's coming off of two losses to uh, Andrade and Lineker, but you know, he did go to the, the distance against Lineker, which was a tough out. Um, I noticed he was a little tentative versus DeAndrage. Didn't really push forward too much, threw some leg kicks. Um, but yeah, I just think he's in a good spot here, man. You look at Burren, he's 10 and five in his career. He is a wrestling based fighter, but you know, Vera has some pretty solid wrestling skills, defensive wrestling skills. He's only been taken down more than once on one occasion, uh, versus Brad Pickett a few years ago. And he's a uh, serviceable grappler on the ground as well. Um, Buren, like I said, wrestling based fighter has some takedown upside, I guess. Um, he took Rolando D down four times, but he still lost the fight. Um, he was dropped early on in that fight, first round, um, and he doesn't really want to exchange and stand. Um, he averages like 1.15 significant strikes per minute in the UFC. Um, and I think with the defensive wrestling of Vera and the lack of striking of Buren, I think this is a good spot for Vera. Um, I'm going to pick him here. I think he's the more experienced guy. He should have success on the feet. Um yeah, man, he's a heavy favorite for a reason. Um, I'm kind of worried about him paying off his salary in tournaments. Um, actually, I had two thoughts on this. We'll make this quick. So is he a cash game lock, the question, first question, due to his odds? And second, um, what do you think his ownership's like in GPPs? Because I think this could be a spot, just like last week, Devin Powell, granted he was cheaper, um, kind of started the slate off strong for those people who played that fight heavily. Do you think yeah. you think this gets overlooked? Um, I don't know if he's completely overlooked because I mean he does have kind of a name and he is a giant favorite. But yeah, I guess you're right. But but it is the first fight of the night, which I think you know always tends to go under owned compared to like where it should be. So um, yeah, I think for Cash, I mean he is the biggest favorite on the card. I think even maybe bigger than than DJ at this point. Um, I put those odds in last night, but yeah, yeah, DJ is minus four ninety. Vera's plus or minus five five fifty. So he's the biggest favorite on the card. He's the second most expensive. So you're getting a little bit of value there. Um, I don't know. Like it kind of. De- we'll see kind of how our, our cash lineup state shake out when we, once we get to the uh, the co main and the main event. Like, is this going to be a week where we have two? Since we have two title fights, you don't want a double stack. Is that going to give you enough left over to fit Vera in? I mean, I think. I think I'd rather have DJ than Vera. Just, you know, he's got five rounds. He's more likely to get, like, takedowns. Um, Finish. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. How's this? 
DJ's finish prop was minus 109 to Vera's plus 138. So, I mean, like, if you can fit him in there, that's that's fine. But I don't think that you just – That's you, what kind of makes me think maybe he's a little lower on than expected in tournaments at least because of Demetrius Johnson being so similar priced. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, he might be – you know he's he's got he's got big upside. I mean, obviously, so does DJ. But everyone's going to be on DJ. He's going to be much much more higher owned. Um, so yeah, Vera, Vera might be kind of like a pivot if you're doing mass entry tournaments. But I mean, he just doesn't have he doesn't have the same floor that DJ has. Um, but I guess I mean, if Beren is really that bad, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you can definitely. Definitely play him if you can fit him. Maybe if you can't pay all the way up to DJ, since you're getting $100 less on Vera, um, maybe you play him in those kinds of lineups. It's a contrarian play. I mean, it's everybody's going to flock to DJ. But All right, let's jump to the next one. That took too long. Wei Li Zhang versus Danielle Taylor. Wei Li Zhang, $8,700. Open at minus 245, is now minus 260. Finish prop, plus 219. Danielle Taylor, 7500 Opened at 175, is now plus 220, with a finish prop of plus 700. So Zhang um, is making her UFC debut coming out of China. Um, she doesn't train at China top team. She trains at Black Tiger Fight Club. Um, but she is the number one ranked strawweight in China, uh, 28 years old, 16 and one. Uh, and she looks like pretty legit. Um, she is a former like Wushu Sanda um, practitioner, uh, BJJ purple belt. She just is like really aggressive and like has pretty solid power in her hand. She's not like a, def a defensive mastermind by any stretch. She, she can like wade in and get hit a, um, a good bit, but she's got really good, she's strong. She's got really good weight transfer on her on her punches. Um, she throws at a high, high volume, like she'll kick from the outside, kind of like stalk her way into range. And then um, as soon as her opponent like plants, her, plants their feet or gets trapped against the cage, uh, plants their feet to kind of throw back, where it gets trapped against the cage, she unloads with a long combination of really powerful punches, um, hooks. Um, she, yeah, or the three-two. Like she looks like a pretty solid fighter, and definitely someone who's going to make some noise in the UFC. Um, she's vicious on the ground. She's crafty from her back, um, and she's dangerous in the clinch, where she just like beats the snot out of people with knees to the body. She's got multiple fi multiple finishes that way. So I think this is really a spot where she's going to be um, kind of overlooked. Like, no one knows who she is, really. I mean, unless you're, like, you know, doing your due diligence on tape study. Um, Taylor's the one with the names. So might, people might be, like, um, or a little bit, you know, a little bit more recognizable having four UFC fights already. People might be kind of confused that, like, Taylor is the, is the pretty sizable underdog here. Um, if they don't know anything about Zhang, but if you watch tape on Zhang, kind of makes kind of makes sense. I'm a little bit surprised that it's the line is quite so wide, um, given that Zhang is making her debut. Um, this fight is in California, not in Asia, and she's been having most of her fights in Asia, so kind of see how that affects her. Taylor is kind of someone that's hard to look good against. Um, she's you know five feet tall, uh, maybe, and. Um, gen generally likes to kind of stay on the outside before like um, like blitzing forward with one or two power punches and then and then ducking back out again. Um, everyone remembers her god awful UFC debut against Marina Moroz, um, but she just doesn't look like she has the tools here. Like she's you know compact and powerful, um, but she is not as aggressive. Doesn't throw as, as much volume. Um, can't really wrestle to you know like try to neutralize. Zhang, she's not going to want to be on the inside, on like much bigger and stronger than she is. Um, Taylor should probably be fighting at atom weight, uh, while Zhang is uh, a pretty strong straw weight. So I'm kind of expecting this this fight to go to decision because uh, Taylor, I think, is after she kind of gets the feel of Zhang, Taylor's going to be on her bike for a lot of it, which might kind of limit um, Zhang's ceiling somewhat. Maybe she doesn't get the stoppage. Um, her finish prop is plus 219, which isn't terrible. She's 8,700. It's not, not, not awful. Um, but I see most likely a decision here where she ends up having to like kick a lot from the outside and might struggle to corral the, the fast, um, Taylor to really put hands on her. But, um, but, um, in terms of a play, I like Zhang here. Uh, you could, you could, 
you could have her in some tournaments, but I wouldn't go like crazy on her again. Like she's probably not going to be wrestling a ton. Um, and again, she might struggle to really track down Taylor uh, for the latter half of this fight. But um, definitely someone who I think is going to go under owned and who I think I would like to be, I would like to have some exposure to. Um, I think that she's going to be good. I think she's going to win. And I think that she's going to give you some volume. So that's my take here. I don't really have any interest in Taylor. All right. Strong breakdown as always. All right. Um, <laughs> yes. Try to, try to speed it up. Um, so we got Alex Perez here taking on Jose Torres. It's the next fight. Um, Perez is 8,700. I'm sorry, 8,400. Excuse me. Um, this opened as a pick of minus 120 each. Perez is now a slight favorite at minus 135 with a finish prop of plus 335. Uh, Torres is 7,800 on DraftKings. Um, after opening at minus 120, he is now a plus 115 underdog. Um, and his finish prop is only slightly worse than Perez's at plus 375. Um, so do you like Perez here or do you like Shorty? So I went back and forth on this fight. I started out liking Perez, and I think I'm going to end up on Torres if you have to make me pick. Um, exciting fight, I think, both ways. Um, I think it's going to be a fun fight. And like I said, I don't really have the strongest read on it because both these guys are fairly young, newer. Um, Perez, Dana White, Tuesday Night Contender alum, 2-0 in the UFC. He has a submission over Carlos de Tomas and a decision over Eric Shelton. Looks to be a pretty confident striker, likes to come forward, um, doesn't throw a ton of output though, 2.78. Um, you know, he throws a lot of feints and big overhand rights. He wants to get the fight to the ground. That's his end goal. He averages four takedowns per fight, um, is relentless. Um, with the, he, I'm sorry, he averages four takedowns per fight, but that is kind of skewed because he took down Eric Shelton five times. Um, so yeah, be that as it may. Um, if he can't get the fight to the mat, I think he's going to be at a disadvantage, quite frankly. Um, his striking's good. Um, but I would favor Torres is striking on this one. He's coming off a KO win over Jared Brooks. And that that was the fight where Brooks kind of slammed himself and uh, knocked himself out. I thought I thought Brooks was winning the fight for sure. Um, Torres continues to stalk forward, throws a bunch of hands, um, has a hell of a chin. He was dropped by Jared Brooks a minute into their fight. Uh, super tough guy, kind of held on there. Um, and, you know, when he got it back to the feet, he still continued to move forward, 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 forward. He didn't care. So he has confidence in that chin. Um, but as the fight went on, I think Torres kind of picked up the speed and aggression and the pace of the fight. I wouldn't say Brooks was gashing, gassing, but I think Torres kind of took it to that next level. And that's definitely something you like to see. Um, this should be fun, Josh. I think this should be a fun fight. Um, I'm going to go with Torres. Um, that's probably contrarian to the, the majority of folks, but I'm going to go with Torres in this one. Um, I just like this kid. I, I think he's tough. He keeps coming forward, throws bombs, you know, looks to finish. Um, all he's got to do is fend off those takedown attempts. And I haven't seen enough um, from Perez to show that, you know, Torres couldn't handle that. So give me Torres here to win this one on the feet via decision, maybe a late round TKO. So for DraftKings purposes, I mean, you, th you like this play on both sides. I mean, you're leaning Torres, so uh, you're getting him at dog money. Um, so that's, you gotta like that. Um, but you're going to have like some, you, you like in the exposure here, these, these flyweights, you think it's, we get a pretty active fight with some grappling and, and the winner scores pretty well. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, the finish props are, aren't, aren't good, but man, I don't know. I'm just something, something about Torres. I like what I saw in that kid. Um, you know, I'll have some exposure to both sides of this by no means am I going all in, but I, I mean, you know, I like Torres. I think he has a high ceiling. Yeah, it looks like a good mid-range fight to to target for some action. So exactly. I like that. All right, next up we got Matt Sales and Shaman Morais. Matt Sales, eighty three hundred dollars, opened at minus one fifteen, is now a minus one hundred five. Finish prop plus two ten. Shaman Morais, seventy nine hundred, minus one twenty five, is now minus one fifteen with a plus two seventy finish prop. So I'm I'm a little bit confused by this line. I mean, I think. Sales is still pretty young in his career. I um, can't remember exactly how long he's been a pro, but not that long. I think he's only like six and one. Um, he had, um, before coming on the contender series, he had his first pro loss um, to a guy who wrestled him a little bit. The, the decision was definitely uh, close. Uh, he he could have, um, I think that he easily could have you know snuck that decision out and, and still be undefeated. Um, but, He's a Muay Thai practitioner. He's got uh, some you know, Muay Thai titles, accolades to his name. 
but so does Marais. Marais is a you know former Brazilian kickboxing and Muay Thai champion. Um, he had some hype kind of coming into the UFC, but then he ran into Zabit Magomed Sharapov, like the most hyped, the most exciting prospect in the maybe in the entire company. Um, and so he obviously he struggled with the, the the wrestling and the grappling and the length of of Zabit. So uh, he didn't have a great showing in his first fight. His other pro loss was to Marlon Marais back in World Series of Fighting. So no, I mean no shame in that. Marlon Marais is extremely good. Um, I think other than that Marais title fight at, at bantamweight, he's fought um, at featherweight, and um, I like him in this spot. I think that he's got more experience and more tools um, than Sales. Sales is he he. He will kick some from the outside, but he generally wants to like just like walk right into the pocket and start unloading um, punch combinations. Um, he's he's aggressive and he's dangerous, but um, I haven't seen it, you know a ton of his other. He he seemed to like follow uh, George Hickman. I think that was the guy who beat him. George. He seemed to follow George Hickman around a lot. A guy who didn't really want to strike with him, wanted to wrestle him, and and Hickman you know had success wrestling him in the first round, but didn't have much success the, the latter two rounds. And the third round was pretty close, and I and ended up going to Hickman in a fight where, like, in a round where he really didn't get a whole lot of wrestling going. So um, it just doesn't, doesn't seem like I think Sales needs to round out his game. He had a really impressive showing on the Contender Series. He wiped his opponent out in less than a round. Hit him with some a couple of uh, counter right hands uh, um, that just flattened him. And so he looked really really good on that. While Morais is coming off kind of getting embarrassed by. Is a beat Magomed Sharapov, but I like um, I like Marais here. Um, I think again that he's got a little more experience. He's got some more tools. I think at longer range, he's got uh, some a nice switch kick to the head and to the body. Um, so I like him too. And he's also got vicious elbows inside. I've just seen a little bit more of his game. Sales might you know might show something here. Um, he is only twenty four, so you know you're. Looking to see a lot of improvement. He trains at Alliance MMA, so good camp. Um, so it should be a pretty competitive fight, but I like Morais. In terms of a play here, um, again, this is kind of like the Torres fight a little bit where the guy I like is 7,900. He, so I'm getting him at, um, as a dog. He, he has a little bit of line value, 7,900 as a minus 115, very slight favorite. So um, you got to like that. I don't know that I would play this this fight in cash necessarily, although like you know, targeting line value is is a strong um, you know technique or play long term. Uh, and I, I don't and I don't hate it. Again, I think that he should be I think that he should be the favorite. Um, so potentially in cash, but definitely more of a fight I'm looking at in GPs. Both these guys come uh, come to kill the other one. So I'm kind of surprised. Kill or be killed, huh? Kill or be killed. Yeah, I'm kind of surprised their finish props are as high as they are, plus 210 and plus 270. Uh, I would not be surprised at all to see a finish here. So definitely a fight you can target on both sides in GPPs. I think more people are going to be on Marais for the salary um, and, and the odds. So sales might be more of a – he's got the better finish prop, and um, I think he's going to be like, not as highly owned for those reasons. So he might be a solid contrarian play in large field tournaments. Um, but I like Marais. I'm going to have uh, more exposure to him. Good. Speaking of uh, kill or be killed, you have 15 seconds. Tell me your thoughts on Poirier versus Diaz. Oh my gosh, dude! I nearly wept last night when I saw that announcement. <laughs> when I got that tweet, I lost it. Oh my! Like, first, I'm so so happy that Diaz is back. Like that he's got a fight, you know, signed pretty much. It seems like. Just, I don't care who it is. I would be pumped, super pumped, just to see him fight. Him fighting Poirier makes me like it's a little bit bittersweet because I love both of them. But they're going to make some just gorgeous violence. It's going to be amazing. Uh, I don't really know who wins. I, it's, I guess I have to sort of side with Poirier. I think that he might be able to get his wrestling going. He's obviously been a lot more active. But I figure that, like, Diaz has been out for almost two years or whatever it is. And you th- you got to think that he's been training for, like, a southpaw hitter. 15 yeah. seconds. Yeah, yeah. So you, I feel like he's been training for Conor McGregor. Like, that, that would make sense to me that he would be – like th- that would be his opponent in mind, and now he's facing another southpaw in Poirier. So I have two two quick thoughts. A, good for Dustin Poirier for getting a fucking huge money fight. Excuse my language, because he's going to get paid. People are going to buy Diaz, the Diaz fight. I don't even know if it's the main event. I, I, right. I, 
Yeah. Anyway. And second of all, I'm interested that Diaz accepted a fight with Poirier. I thought he would want a bigger fight. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's uh, him, I'm pumped. Maybe maybe he accepted it because it's going to be on the Madison Square Garden card, and he wants pay per view, like, and he and negotiated yeah, I mean, pay per view points, even though he's not a champion. He is a draw in his own right too. I right. keep forgetting that. So yeah. All good. right, sorry about that. Let's get back. All good. All right, so we got uh, Ricardo Hamos. Uh, taking on Kyung Ho Kang. Hamos is 8,600. Uh, he opened at minus 245. The line has closed slightly. He's now a minus 210 favorite with a finish prop of plus 181. Kang opened at plus 175. Um, has adjusted up and down, but is right back at one, plus 175. Um, and has a finish prop of plus 265. He's 7,600 on DraftKings. So uh, do you like Hamos here? Looks seems to have some line value. Um... Hold on, what'd you say? Maybe he doesn't have a ton. Oh, negative net line value. Yeah. Um, this is another tough one, obviously. Ricardo Hamos, Muay Thai striker, fights kind of long. Um, he's 2 0 in the UFC. He has wins over Michinori, Tanaka, and most recently a, KO over, K, a knockout win over Amon Zahabi. Uh, he got Zahabi to the ground early in their fight, had some slick grappling um, on the ground. He's a black belt in jujitsu. Um, he averages about 3.23 strikes on the feet, which are meh. Uh, absorbs 2.74, which isn't that bad as well. Um, what I noticed most about his last fight was he was gassing out bad, and I hate that. His mouth is wide open, deep breaths, punches were labored, um, and that's a big red flag for me. It, it always has been. Um, you look at Ho Kang, very low active striker at 1.93 strikes per minute, only absorbs 1.58. Um, and he averages 2.6 takedowns per fight. Um, he's pretty explosive. He's quick, um, light on his feet. He has some explosive striking. He's a decent wrestler. Um, and in top control, he's just absolutely suffocating as well as he's very comfortable off of his back. Um, Josh, this is one where I would put on the glasses and do the uh, hot take alert, but I'm not going to do it because you can't, can't see it. But I'm going to go with Kang here. Uh-oh. Yeah. Going on a limb. Go yes, ahead. low active striker, but he loves the takedowns. Okay. Um, and Ramos has a history of gassing. And I hate gas tank fighters, man. Because, like, you gas in your last fight. Like, how often do they come out and have zero gas tank issues their next fight out? You know, sometimes it still rears its ugly head. It's not something that they fix, you know, in one camp, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go with Ho Kang here uh, for the takedown upside. I just don't know if Ramos can, you know, his gas tank can hold up for, for takedown attempts across three rounds so give me ho kang here um gpp only okay do you have any, any interest in hamos gpp play too i mean yeah mid-range lineup sure he fits the bill he definitely has some upside to finish but yeah his finish round plus 181 is not not too terrible so uh but yeah i like the take of kang like the wrestling upside for sure at 7600 gpp only let me reiterate okay I think you guys blow me up all right, Ricky Simon, Montel Jackson. Ricky Simon, 8500 bucks. Opened at minus 175, is now down to minus 125, plus 260 finish prop. Montel Jackson, 7700 opened at 145. Good line movement is now plus 105 with a finish prop, a better finish prop, plus 232. So are you on Jackson here with that line value? Um, I kind of like Simon in this fight, but um, I'll, I'll have exposure to, to Jackson as well. Um, so both these guys are pretty young, and so we should, you know, would tend to see improvement from these guys. Um, Jackson is uh, 26, fights at Pura Vida B or fights out of Pura, v Pura Vida BJJ with Rick Glenn and Zach Otto, I believe. Um, while Ricky Simone uh, trains out of Gracie Barra Portland with Rick Story, Chael Sonnen, Ed Herman, um, I believe, are his, you know, training partners, or whatever. But um, Simon or Simone had, uh, you know, he had that crazy fight in his last fight against Murad uh, Dvalishvili, where he had he kind of, you know, got out outworked. Like Dvalishvili is just kind of crazy wild man, just kept throwing really aggressive um, punches and kicks and takedowns, and um, but Simone was able to get you know a guillotine and roll into mount uh, with like a minute left in the fight, and Dvalishvili is like kicking his legs, kicking his legs, and it seems like he's out, but he just like keeps kicking his legs, and his arms are just kind of like laying there. Um, and then finally the, you know, the clock 
runs out and Devalishvili like just kind of lays there. He doesn't seem like he's completely unconscious, but he like seems you know out of it. So they call it you know that he was that he was out. He might have been. It's just kind of a weird fight, but um, I've liked what I've seen in terms of the improvement from from Simone. He's um, got a little bit more experience, a little bit uh, more pro fights under under his belt. Uh, while Montel Jackson is a dangerous southpaw striker um, for sure, but haven't seen a whole lot of his other like ancillary skills. Like he he's coming off the contender series where he had a really overmatched opponent and just kind of like beat the snot out of him, but still managed to foul him like multiple times and get a, get a point taken away. Maybe a second one, I can't remember, but um, just a really ugly fight where he was completely dominant, but also just fouling the crap out of his opponent. Um, so he's powerful, he's dangerous, but Simone has turned like has his striking has come has come uh, a long way. He doesn't throw just one power shot at a time and then duck under for a takedown. He throws in combination. One thing I really love about him, uh, about a striking game, is he throws a double left hook. He'll go to the body and then he'll go to the head, uh, which I really like. I think he, before coming, he was on the contender series and won like a close decision and then, um, or a competitive decision and then had a couple fights in LFA. In his last fight in LFA, he knocked this dude out in a minute with that double left hook. Um, so, like to see the, like the improvements I see from him, like the wrestling I see from him. I haven't really seen uh, Montel Jackson's wrestling really uh, challenged. And um, Simone had trouble in the past with like controlling opponents on the ground in his contender series win. He got like 10 or 12 takedowns, but the dude would just stand right back up again. Um, so he's improved that. He's gotten better at, at control. His submission game, obviously, as, as we've seen, has uh, become more dangerous. So uh, give me Simone in the spot. Um, Despite the, uh, you know, the negative line value on Simone, I want exposure to him. Obviously, for the wrestling, if he's going to be lower owned because of Jackson's line uh, value, then you know, great. Uh, I guess I will have you know, you can't totally ignore that line value on Jackson. He is dangerous. He does have a better finish prop, like you pointed out. Um, so he does merit rostering. But I want to have a little bit more exposure to Simon or Simone. Sorry. Um, I think his upside is a lot, a lot higher than I can win here. So that's my take on it. So there. All right. Well, I will tee up the next one. I don't know if you're muted or what, but um, here we go. Next fight, last prelim. My bad. Uh, dude, that's dude, that's all it's all good. Here we go. Next prelim, Pedro Munoz versus Brett Johns. Uh, this should be a good one. I'm excited for this one. This card, I mean, we mentioned this off air, but this card is – not awesome. I mean, he's got the the title doubleheader at the top. After that, you know, we got a lot of like contender series guys on here. So, uh, but Munoz John should be good, and the next one Swanson Moicano should be good. So excited for those. Anyway, Munoz is at eighty eight hundred. He opened at minus one fifty five, uh, but is now all the way out to minus two forty with a finished prop of plus one eighty one. So pretty solid there. Uh, John's is seventy four hundred. He opened at plus one fifteen, but has risen all the way to plus two hundred. With a finished prop of plus six seventy five, so are you on uh, Munoz here or what? Yeah, I'm on Munoz. Um, coming off a loss to John Dodson, but prior to that, he ran off four straight wins. This guy's a top ten fighter. Um, he's a super active striker. Throws about four point two strikes per minute. Um, he also eats five point four four. So you know it's going to be you know an active fight typically when he's involved. Um, Despite his striking ability, he does have three submissions in the UFC um, and one knockout as well. Uh, he's not going to throw a ton of takedowns. Um, he's probably going to strike with Brett Johns or at least attempt to. Um, and, you know, when you're fighting Brett Johns, you have to look at your takedown offense. Munoz's takedown offense has been average, 60, 60%. Um, but I think that, that number is a little – that doesn't really tell the story. He's only been taken down three times in the UFC. Um, so – yeah, I like Munoz in this spot. Um, Johns, I think he's taken a huge step up in competition here. He had three impressive wins when he came out. Um, but then he lost to Aljamain Sterling, who kind of flipped the tables on him and took him down three times. Um, so, yeah, you know Johns wants to take down, uh, take the fight to the ground. Averages 4.95 takedowns per fight. Um, I think that's a little skewed as well because he had an 11 takedown performance in his first fight. Um and you look at him on the feet, low active striker, 2.92 while absorbing 3.74. Um, super fun guy to root for, but um, I just think this is a step up for him, and I'm worried about it. I think Munoz has done a great job defending takedowns in his career. Um, that's where Johns is going to 
you know, challenge him. Um, I think if he holds off those takedowns, he should have the advantage on the feet because uh, Johns does absorb a lot of strikes. So, I mean, Sterling landed 89 significant strikes on him and three takedowns in their first fight. So give me Munoz here to win a striking affair via decision. Um, cash game, yeah, I think you can play and GPP as well. It's good finish prop, line movement, minus 240. So, good deal. Yeah, I like it. I like I like Munoz as well. All right, let's jump into the next one here. Hey, not all Moicano versus Cub Swanson. Moicano, 9100. Open at minus 165. Is now minus 370. Holy smokes. Finish prop, plus 349. Cub Swanson, 7100. Opened at plus 125. Is now plus 310 with a 617 finish prop. Holy crap. No respect for Cub. Yeah, I'm a little surprised the line has gotten as wide as it has. But, I mean, I don't know. Every Everyone that I've seen on social media and stuff has been – um, talking about how Moicano is going to run Swanson over. Moicano is coming off a really impressive win over Calvin Cater. Cater had, you know, had his own really impressive, I think, first two fights in the UFC, beating Andre Feely and uh, Shane Burgos. Um, the Burgos with like a, just a gorgeous, absolutely savage knockout. So he came into the Moicano fight with like a lot of hype behind him, and Moicano just destroyed him with leg kicks. Uh, never let Moicano, or never let Cater really get his boxing going. Um, so I, I'm guessing people are kind of see, envisioning something similar there. Plus, he's got uh, a really solid, very very solid grappling game to fall back on if he does end up getting taken down here. Um, Swanson, really well rounded guy, uh, savvy veteran. Um, he's coming off back losses though, unfortunately, um, to uh, Brian Ortega had that that guillotine, and then we were in Atlantic City when he was getting kind of boxed up by Frankie Edgar. Um, did a good job in that fight, avoiding the takedown. Like um, in their first matchup, he got just mauled on the ground by Edgar. Uh, this time I think he was really, really worried about the takedowns. And so he ended up just getting punched in the face a whole bunch of times. So he's kind of on a slide while Moicano is kind of on come up. Moicano is also young, um, much younger than, than the veteran Cub. I think the fight should be like, you know, a – Somewhat competitive stand-up battle for the most part, um, but but yeah, I have to favor Mo Moicano here. I think um, those kicks are going to be a serious weapon, and um, he throws just at a crazy rate, five point eight two significant strikes uh, per minute. Um, lands about about a takedown per round at fifty five percent accuracy. So, pro I mean, like we might see these guys exchange takedowns, but I don't expect to see you know a ton of extended ground exchanges. We might, um, and those would be fun for sure, I think. But anyway, um, yeah, I mean, he, he throws nearly two significant strikes more per minute than Cub, who's at 4.15 significant strikes. So just like this, those kicks, the output, the uh, grappling base that he can fall back on, the fact that Cub uh, is going to want to be like, I don't know, probably in and out, and I think he's going to have a hard time doing that. It's, um, yeah, like you said, no respect for Cub, I think. The line probably shouldn't be quite as wide as it is, um, which makes the DraftKings play interesting. Um, Moicano looks like the third most, third biggest favorite on the card behind DJ and Vera. He's the fourth most expensive though. Um, Thiago Santos is more expensive than him by hundred dollars and is not as big of a favorite, but you know they're comparable. So maybe get a little bit of line value there, uh, but you're not getting a great finish prop at plus three forty nine. You're probably not going to get much wrestling, so you're relying on a uh, obviously striking-based uh, decision in all likelihood. And he could put up, you know, he put up 116 significant strikes on Cater, so that's uh, you know approaching 90 points um, in, in, in a victory there. I can't remember if he had any knockdowns or not. So you know, that might be not quite as high enough of a ceiling as I would like um, for someone who's 90, 9100. So I probably won't have a ton of exposure to Moicano here. Um, Swanson, you know, he could be he, he could be a punt, and I guess in either cash or GPPs. Um, you know, he's a pretty big underdog, plus three ten with a plus six seventeen finish prop. So he doesn't have a ton of upside. Um, big underdog, so it's not somebody that you want to be investing a ton of money in. But if he were to scrape out somehow, like uh, a decision, I wouldn't be totally shocked. But um, he should be around for three rounds in a pretty active striking battle. Um, at worst, so maybe more of a cash punt if you wanted to go that way. But then again, I mean, you have like Cejudo 
um, as well if you're going to going to be stacking that fight. So um, probably a fight overall that I'm more interested in just kind of watching from a fan's perspective uh, to see where these guys are at than, than playing for DraftKings. But that's sort of my take there. you have anything else to add? No, man, I think that's pretty good. All right. Um, so next up, we got Pollyanna Vienna taking on J.J. Aldrich. Vienna is a pretty sizable favorite here uh, at minus 210. Uh, just up and down, but is back at minus 210. She's 8,900 on DraftKings with a finish prop of plus 182. Uh, another another fighter in that plus 180 finish prop range. Aldrich uh, is the underdog. She comes back at plus 175 after opening at plus 160. Um, and her finish prop is plus 570. She's 7,300. On DraftKings, so do you like Vanna here? Do you think you can pay all the way up for her at 8,900? Yeah, I think this might be a sneaky spot here. I like Vianna. Um, Ten and one in her career, she's one and zero in the UFC. Defeated Maya Stevenson in her debut. She has six submissions and four TKOs to her name. Um, striking middle of the range, 3.13 strikes per minute. Um, you know, she fights very long. It's not overly technical. Throw some wide swinging punches. Kind of leaves her chin up there from time to time. Um, but I think she's progressing as her career goes on and on. Um, her s submission grappling, it looks strong to me as well. She her fight with Stevenson was a clinch affair, and the size and strength of Vienna was just too much. Got her to the ground, took her down three times, eventually took the back, and ended up finishing her off. Um, you know, She's really good at using those long limbs to gain position, um, and she's just a very talented grappler. So you look at Aldrich, 6-2. In her career, two and one in the UFC, pretty active striker, 4.07 strikes. She absorbs about 4.13. Um, southpaw fighter, likes to strike. De defensively, it's kind of questionable. Um, you know, she uses her kicks well to establish range, and she's an average striker at, a, at a, an above average rate, I would say. Um, but this is a grappler versus striker affair. If you look at all just its career, um, she has pretty decent takedown defense. Sure, yeah, she was taken down by Juliana Lima four times, but. That was her debut fight, and Lima's no slouch. So I don't want to put too much into that. After that fight, she's only been taken down like once or twice. Um, I look at Vienna, and she doesn't really shoot for double legs. She uses clinch trips to get it down, so it's hard for me to say that Vienna is going to shoot for takedowns, take Aldrich to the ground, um, you know, where she wants to have this fight. So Aldrich obviously wants to stand and bang, strike at range. Uh, the question is, can she, you know, maintain on the feet? Can she not get taken down? Um, Viana's always moved forward in her career, gets the fight up against the cage, gets him to the ground. Um, I don't think Aldrich is athletic enough, um, you know, or talented enough to avoid that for three rounds. I think at some point Aldrich gets her to the ground, um, and that's where she likes to work. So give me Viana here. Um, Aldrich wants to strike. Viana wants to get it to the ground. I think Viana gets it there at some point. Um, and I think she might go under own because not a lot of people know about her. Um, so I think this could be a decent spot as well to kind of differentiate your lineups. So give me Viana second round submission. Good deal. I like it. Uh, if, you're, if you're right, I mean, she's going to have no trouble paying off that price. I don't think so. Right. Um, nice sneaky little play there. All right. Tiago Santos, $9,200 opened at minus 275 is now minus minus. 345 with a finish prop of minus 177. Holy smokes. Kevin Holland, $7,000, opened at 215, is now plus 285 with a plus 425 finish prop. Who is Kevin Holland? And he is the sacrificial lamb, no? Um, I, I did write on Twitter, like, as soon as they announced this fight, I think they announced it on, like, on the Contender Series uh, pretty recently. I mean, this fight came together not that long ago. And I don't think – I went to look because I thought – uh, Holland might have been like a, a late replacement for some for for Santos, uh, but I can't I couldn't find like who Santos's original opponent was supposed to be, and it doesn't seem like there was one unless I'm uh, mistaken. So this fight kind of came together last minute. I think Santos was a backup for the uh, Adesanya Tavares fight, so I guess maybe he had kind of been um, you know in Vegas already, um, and this fight's in Anaheim, so you know not. Not far from there, I guess maybe the UFC just got him, tried to get him a quick fight since he uh, made the trip from Brazil. Um, but yeah, I mean, Santos is kind of a killer be killed kind of fighter. I mean, he's coming off uh, a first round knockout to David Branch, not a dude who's known for his knockouts. Um, that, so, was, that was a surprise. Yeah, it was. Um, 
you know, everyone thought Branch was going to watching that together. Was that in Norfolk? Uh, yeah, it might have been. Or Pittsburgh? Uh, Atlantic City, yeah. One oh, of those. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so he's got a little bit of a questionable chin. I mean, you're getting knocked out by uh, Dave Branch, right hook. I mean, it was a flush punch. Um, so, you know, and then he also had that, like, really embarrassing loss to Eric Spicely when he was a giant favorite. So, you know, Santos is a little bit untrustworthy in terms of his chin, in terms of his – um, I don't want to necessarily say his fight IQ. I think he got hurt in the Spicely fight, but whatever. Anyway, um, before the Dave Branch fight, he just murdered uh, Jack Marshman, Gerald Mearshart, uh, Jack Hermanson, and Anthony Smith, fighters who are all better than um, Kevin Holland. Holland uh, is coming off the Contender Series. He had kind of a lackluster win. Um, I don't think that he got a contract that night because he, he wanted to kind of like style on his opponent who was like way shorter than him. Um, and didn't really go for the kill. Holland likes to kind of like, he's really, really long and tall. So, um, you know, he, he'll do kicks from the outside, sometimes like kind of flashy ones. He likes to do side kicks to the leg. Um, he actually had a pretty competitive fight with Curtis Millender um, before Millender, I guess, dropped to welterweight. I don't know how Millender makes welterweight, that dude. I mean, because like uh, Holland is long for, for middleweight, and they looked like pretty similar um, frame-wise. But anyway... Um, the, the, the problem in that, in that Milliner fight was that I think Holland seemed to gas by the second round. Like he had a, he had a good first round, thought he won the first round. Um, but ended up kind of a little bit more of a sitting duck, um, against, against Milliner. He would like cover up, um, and just kind of like Milliner would, you know, punch around his guard or kick his legs, um, or whatever. And he just, his footwork kind of fell apart. Um, he does use that side kick to the leg and body as kind of like a jab. So that might be what he tries to do here is try to stay away from Santos. Hope Santos like gets tired um, or else he can catch him coming like bum rushing him when Santos does that. Um, but Santos hits, you know, hits way harder, has a lot more experience at this high level is just way stronger. Um, I don't think Holland is much of a wrestler. Uh, he's also, he's not a bad grappler. I think he's a BJJ uh, Brown belt, but he's, you know, a little bit too willing to work from his back which is not something you want to want to do um, against Thiago Santos. His ground and pound is absolutely vicious. So, yeah, I mean, Santos has the best finish prop on the card by a mile, minus 177. He's definitely a very solid play um, in cash or GBPs. If you were making a lot of lineups, um, I wouldn't hate necessarily throwing Holland into – you know, um, into a lineup if you're making, you know, a ton of lineups. Um, you don't want to – invest in a plus 285 underdog a lot, especially in a fight where he could end up getting murked in the first round. But we have seen Santos slip on a banana peel before. We have we have seen that his chin is a little bit questionable. Um, Holland is a, is a decent striker, but he uh, doesn't have great defense. And um, I think he's going to end up getting punched out here by Santos. So that's my take there. Anything to add or are you muted again? No, sorry, man. I'm distracted. I'm uh... – I was talking to my buddy. I'm staying at his place. We're in a wedding this weekend, so a bunch of stuff's going on. Yeah, I got you. All right. Um, so we go into the uh, the title fight doubleheader now. we got Henry Cejudo taking on Demetrius Johnson. Uh, Johnson is the most expensive fighter on the card, but he's not you know, ridiculously expensive. He's 9,400. Um, he'll been at minus 475, um, has adjusted up and down, but is now minus 485 with a, the second-best finish prop on the card, I think, at minus 109. Cejudo uh, comes back as the plus 385 underdog after opening a plus 325 um, with a five a plus 567 finish prop. He's $6,800 on DraftKings. So those odds aren't ridiculously wide like we've seen in some of DJ's past fights. I think Cejudo's getting some respect here. Like, looks like he's improved lately. Uh, do you think he has any shot here against DJ, or does DJ just, you know, have another walk in the park in front of him? Yeah, man. Um... I'm not breaking this one down too much. I mean, we've seen these guys go before. I just think Demetrius Johnson is the GOAT. Like, I think they're just feeding him, you know, whoever's next. Let's go. Because he can't they, – they didn't make the TJ fight. They're like, oh, okay, well, so who does one, two straight against Wilson Hayes and Anthony Pettis? Um, or no, was that – Sergio. That, that wasn't Anthony Pettis, was it? That was his brother, Sergio. Um, yeah, he knocked out Wilson Hayes, took Sergio Pettis to decision, took him down three times won that fight. Um, 
I don't know, man. Do you think Cejudo has a shot here? Like, to me, like the fact that we're even questioning DJ at this point against somebody who's already faced could be insulting. I think it's I'm just I'm I, I just I can't bet against DJ. Sorry, I can't. Zero chance. Yeah, I mean that makes sense. You, yeah, you don't want to. I wouldn't. If play he fought TJ, yeah, maybe I would take a, like a flyer on TJ, but I just don't. I can't bet money on Cejudo at plus three eighty five with a finished prop five sixty seven. Like in DraftKings, I'm just. I don't know, man. The odds I, of that happening are needle in a haystack. Forget that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm with I'm with you there. Uh, DJ has, you know, he's the he's the goat. He's so just ridiculously good. He has uh, pretty much like no known weaknesses. He has been caught a few times, but um, has recovered really, really well and gone to like dominate those fights anyway. Um, I, I don't expect this fight to be as much of a blow as it was the first time. Um, I mean, DJ really embarrassed Cejudo, and Cejudo has gotten has I think gotten demonstrably better since then. Um, you know, there were kind of rumors that he was not really taking taking MMA all that seriously. He had Golden Gloves experience and uh, an Olympic gold medal in wrestling, so maybe he thought that he would just kind of like waltz in and, and dominate everybody. And, you know, we saw him, seemed like he kind of coasted in some of his fights. He blew weight in a whole bunch of his fights um, earlier in his career. Didn't seem like he was taking all that seriously. And since that, since getting absolutely embarrassed, it looks like he has kind of dedicated himself, rededicated himself um, and we've seen him look a lot better. I mean, he that fight with Joseph Benavidez, like the longtime number two in the division, he was extremely competitive with, you know, arguably could have won that fight. Um, and then he really, you know, he dominated Wilson Hayes and uh, didn't finish Sergio Pettis, but, you know, really controlled that fight from start to finish too. So um, he's one of the best athletes that DJ is going to face. Um, you know, so in that realm alone, you know, he, he can compete with DJ there. Um, but, you know, going skill for skill against one of the greatest fighters ever, he, he's not going to measure up. He does hit hard. He does have, like, that wrestling. But, you know, no one's ever been able to really, like, take and hold DJ down for any length of time. It would have to be, I think, like some kind of um, mass, massive punch. Like, he's got the puncher's chance, and, and that's pretty much it. Because you're not going to – It has to be a flu. Oh, you're not going to submit DJ, I don't think so. Um, yeah, dude. I mean, if Cejudo goes out there – and just kills the entire slate, so be it. It was one of those cards. Just zero interest. Give me DJ. How about how about cash stack? Do you have interest in that? Between this and the uh, the main event, and quite frankly, I think this could go longer than the main event. I agree. I think I see this fight going longer than the main event too. I think the main event ends probably, you know, under two and a half rounds. Those guys are gonna chuck bombs at each other until someone falls down again. I think. Um, so this one I can definitely see going longer. Um, I think we, we have more potential for takedowns here. I think we probably, you know, maybe get, maybe get a higher pace from these guys cause they're not going to be, you know, throwing everything with knockout intent. Um, so yeah, I definitely don't hate this as a cash stack. I don't hate the other, the main event as a cash stack either. Um, considering the double stack, what do you think about that? Am I crazy? I don't know, man. I've never been a, a double stack guy. Um, I don't know. I've never. I, I, I haven't really thought into you know the double stack because you know four out of six of your guys are booked. You're guaranteed two wins. I mean, you got to get those other two wins to to cash. But I've never thought about it. Um, I just started playing cash like six or eight months ago, so this hasn't ha happened too often. So I'll be interested to see what other people have to say and the strategy behind it. So. Yeah. Um, while you, while you, okay. So um, I guess it's it's safe to say that you know you, know, you want DJ in, in tournaments if you can afford him. Yeah. Are, are yeah. you going all in on? Are you going all in on DJ? Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I won't have any Cejudo, but like GPPs, I think a lot of people flock to DJ, which is smart. Um, you know, but for some reason he doesn't get a finish, or I just I just think he's so safe. Yeah, you can't beat that combination of safety and ceiling. Like, you know. It's so safe. And, like, I was trying to talk myself, you know, fade Demetrius Johnson for a Vera, you know, just to be different. Um, but it's just – DJ's just so safe. It just sucks that everybody's going to be on him. Mm -hmm. I mean, so you have to hope for him to lay an egg or, 
you know, him have a finish in the first 10 seconds with one punch and then Vera outscores him. I don't know, man. Yeah. Um, Could go if, if you're anyway, but I think it goes Demetrius puts up over a hundred points. Yeah. If you're, if you're not making 150 lineups, you know, if you're not maxing the contest out, I mean, I don't think it makes a whole lot of sense to pivot from Vera. I mean, like, can <laughs> If you're only making a few lineups, there's no way that you can like rationalize playing Vera over DJ. Like he's just. I know. agree. But Beren is a terrible fighter. But you know you have the potential for five rounds for DJ. You've got you know his wrestling, uh, his activity. Um, he's in, an infinitely better fighter than Vera. So unless you're making a ton of lineups and you're and you're just kind of hoping for that that situation where Vera somehow by like some mir- not a miracle I guess but like by some kind of crazy happenstance maybe he gets a couple of knockdowns and a first round finish. And manages to outscore DJ, like unless you're right. It's got a lot's got to fall. I think it's just the safety is through the roof with DJ. So uh, real quick, what I just kind of like plug this in with if you if you double stack, you have um, eighty eight hundred average left over. So you know you can get pr- a couple of pretty solid favorites to go along with that double stack. Um, so I'm not sure yet who I'm going to plug in there, but that's probably going to be the strategy I would. Go with, um, do you think, I don't know if we got a definitive answer here. Do you think that you would rather uh, double stack the the flyweight fight or the bantamweight fight? I told you, the DJ fight. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's, I, I think I agree with that too. Um, I mean, we'll just kind of fold this into our um, our next you know fight analysis here. But, um, you know, I think your your floors with, with even with Cejudo is like, you know, a little bit safer than your floor with like Garban and, and, and TJ. Right. That, if that fight ends in the first round, one of those guys is going to score like, you know, less than 10 points. Um, so, you have, you know, one dude's going to, you know, has 110 point upside or 100 point upside um, at least. But so for, you know, mid range, 8,200, 8, 8,000, whatever they cost, that's definitely going to pay off. Um, so this is, this is a fight again with like with five rounds. If it does go later, they're going to put up some striking numbers um, that I would not. I definitely would not hate stacking. I think I agree. If I if I was only going to stack one, it would be the DJ fight just to get him in there as as safety. Yeah. And, um, and Cejudo's floor, I think, is solid. But uh, I might end up going with the double stack just because you know you're going to get you know you're going to get a lot of points out of that main event. Uh, it's hard to envision a, a scenario where that fight does not score well. Where it doesn't finish, or at least um, you know, put up a bunch of points from like a bunch of strikes from, for five rounds. Um, would you agree with that? Yeah, I would. And speaking of that, I think it's time to jump into the main event: um, Cody Garbrandt versus TJ Dillashaw, a rematch for the strap. Um, let me read the. There we are. TJ Dillashaw, 8,200 bucks. Opened at minus 135, is now minus 120. Finished prop, plus 171. Cody Garbrandt, 8,000, minus 105, is now plus 100, and is plus 185. So you talked about the the uh, stacks for this. Mm-hmm. So we understand that. Pick a winner. I like TJ, but uh, it's definitely... I mean, it's definitely close. I, I don't want to say it's quite a coin flip. I do favor uh, TJ a little bit. Um, and I think that's, unfortunately, I think that's where, you know, most people are going since, you know, he won by spectacular knockout the first time. And then everyone remembers the fact that he got knocked down and nearly, nearly finished himself near the end of that first round. I think he's just got a little bit more tools and, uh, you know, he can change stuff up a little bit, give some different looks. Um, Garbrandt is just, he's pretty straightforward. I mean, he, he had a, a really masterful performance against Dominic Cruz but um, I think a lot of that might have just been like a really great style matchup for him that we, you know, he also fought a really smart fight. You know, everyone remembers in the lead up to the Cruz fight that Cruz was absolutely running circles around him in the trash talk and, and Cody was like getting all flustered and, um, you know, just kind of seemed like an idiot. And then he comes in and fights like a masterful fight and absolutely dummies Cruz, which is really surprising. But um, he kind of was just, he's, he's got really, really fast, powerful hands. Um, and he waited for Cruz to kind of like, you know, bounce around on the outside and then and then kind of like lunge in. And then when whenever Cruz would like commit and lunge in and then try to angle out, Cody would just crack him hard a couple of times uh, on the way out. So he was landing 
you know, harder and, and pretty much just as often as Cruz, who you know, usually makes his bones like, um, you know, being faster, out voluming guys, being able to mix in takedowns. And he wasn't able to do that against, against uh, Garbrandt either. Um, so just a really great performance from him. But TJ mixes things up a little bit more, can like, can go, you know, his, he has like, you know, the kind of the same reputation for that, for that, like, you know, wild, crazy footwork, but he uses a little bit more, a little bit differently. He isn't so like roundabout. Um, he is willing to kind of hang out in the pocket a little bit more, which we saw that's dangerous, obviously, again, as we saw in the first fight, it's dangerous to hang out in the pocket there, but, um, you know, he doesn't mind being in there and throwing in volume and, and being dangerous. And then, and then he can also be on the outside and kick, uh, which Garbrandt doesn't do a whole lot. Um, the wrestling again, probably nullifies itself for the most part in this fight. Um, something I've heard people talk about a little bit was we've seen TJ in rematches. Like he had the rematch with, uh, Rafael Sunsau and, uh, the rematch with Hen and Burrell. And in both cases, he, you know, he dominated Burrell the first time too, but I mean, he, he came back and, and, you know, solidly won the Sunsau rematch. We haven't seen Garbrandt rematch yet, so it's going to be interesting to see how he adjusts. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely a dangerous fight. Garbrandt has got has got the power to finish the fight at any time, and and TJ is willing to um, exchange with him in the pocket, as we saw. Um, so definitely a fight that I want exposure to on both sides in tournaments. I'm not going to go. I think you would be insane to go all in on someone in this fight. Um, it is priced like right in the mid range. Uh, as close to the mid range, I don't think we have an 81, 8100 fight. So this is as close to the mid range as we can get. Um, so I definitely think that you could play it pretty much close to 100% in tournaments, one way or the other. Uh, like the fight as a whole, 100%, because you know the winner of this fight scoring less than 90, I think, would be very surprising, right? Um, yeah, I would totally agree with that. This is going to be a stupid fun fight. Yeah. So I'm definitely excited for it. They, they both have awesome finish props. I don't expect it to finish. Uh, so give me, you know, give me TJ to repeat, you know, by second round knockout. But uh, I'm going to have exposure both ways. Garbrandt, I don't know if he would count necessarily as like a contrarian play. No way. I mean, he's going to be popular. I think TJ is going to be more popular. So my, my ownership is probably going to reflect the field for the most part there. I don't know that... Um, I don't. I don't know that I can necessarily go like super overweight on TJ. Just I mean, no, you got to split this. Yeah, simple as that. Yeah, this fight could go either way. Um, Cody's been talking about you know he was injured. He only took the money fight because he needed the money. And I mean, okay, I get that, but he got caught. It's simple as that. TJ caught him um, with an extra ten seconds. Cody's still the champ after he knocked him. You know, put him on his ass in the first round. Um, I love this fight. I cannot wait for this fight. Um, I am a full disclosure. I'm a diehard Cody Garbrandt fan. I just bought last time we were on the podcast, Josh, last Thursday, we were talking about Cody, whatever. And I, I told you I was going to do it. I went out and I bought two Cody, no love t-shirts. I'm in Cleveland for the weekend repping it. Um, I want him to win so bad, but from DraftKings, you got to have, you know, exposure to both sides of this. Pretty um pretty unfortunate what came out, what came out about him this week. Did you see? Yeah, that was shitty. Yeah, that's that's what not awesome. It? That's like the new thing in like sports. People are dumpster diving on Twitter accounts looking for, you know, stuff to bury somebody. Like a get a life. B, we were all different people ten years ago and did stupid things and said stupid things. Yeah, uh, I totally agree. Yeah, I feel like he, I feel like he has doesn't have the best upbringing either. So like, yeah, maybe that was the norm for him in his the culture that he grew up in. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just speculating. Yeah, it's definitely not a good look. He did kind of like own up to it to a certain degree, but then he was also like, "Stop asking me about this. I'm done talking about it." Like, I'm focused. Yeah, I mean, just you, you could have just left it with like, "Yeah, I was young and dumb, and it, it was stupid, and I shouldn't have done it, and I'm sorry." And just ended it there. Like, you didn't have to be like get all snippy and defensive about it, right? Uh, you know. Anyway, um, yeah, it's not a great look after you buy two Cody No Love shirts. But um, yeah, you've been you've been a fan for a long, long time. Definitely love watching the dude fight. Um, so I'm excited for excited for this weekend. 
Um, I mean, it's pumped. I'm pumped. Um, that about wraps it up uh, for the show today, guys. Josh, are there any questions? Uh, the only question we had in the chat was from uh, from our dude, Khabib, Khabib's pet bear. Thank oh, you uh, for, for watching. Um, he wanted a quick take from you on, on SummerSlam, and I have, can't, can't contribute at all, so I'll just step out of the way. SummerSlam. All right, I'll go up the card with you. I think the New Day wins the tournament, and they face the Bludgeon Brothers. Blood and Brothers win. I'll take Cedric Alexander. I'll take Becky Lynch. Rollins, because then he'll feud with Drew McIntyre. Strowman, Styles, Rousey, Reigns, and then Braun cashes in. And you heard it here from uh, the uh, Daily Fantasy Knockout resident pro wrestling expert. It's still uh, real to me, damn it. I'm, I'm learning some. Uh, I'm learning some some terminology, but beyond that, I I can't can't contribute at all. But thank you for watching, and uh, thanks for the question. I don't think we really had any other um, you know MMA DFS related questions. Um, so so yeah. Good. Thank you guys for tuning in. A little late this weekend, but I uh, appreciate you um, listening every week. Make sure to like all of our content, give us a retweet, and uh, good luck this weekend. Peace. Peace.